Uh, welcome to my own channel, <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> where you. I just I have questions about certain things, and I'm just like looking for people who can answer those questions. Um, and for this episode, I guess mm -hmm. I am exploring the relationship in, between professors and students and maybe bigger is more like adults versus young people okay. like myself. So I'm very happy that I finally got the chance to interview you after taking your class for two two years. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. I'm I'm really honored that you uh asked me to participate in this. So I'm Chris Murphy. Uh I know that these days, like when people introduce themselves, it's very out of fashion to lead with like your job because we say like, oh, I'm more than just my job. Like I, but actually uh, I take my job pretty seriously and I don't really do much other than teach and work. So, um, so I'm, I'm currently a visiting assistant professor at Swarthmore college. That means it's not a permanent position. It's just a, a temporary position where I teach software engineering. I guess before that, and how you and I met was when I taught at Bryn Mawr College. I was a senior lecturer. I was there for three years, and then I was at Penn for 10 years. Prior to that, also in a teaching uh, track role. There's not much outside of work, I guess, mm -hmm. but I live in Philadelphia. I've lived here since 2010. I, I totally love it. it 2010? Kind of, yeah, so wow. I'm, I'm graduated from grad school um, in, in 2010, moved here then. There were two years when we lived in Baltimore, but since 2010, we've lived here for, except for two years. Um, so my wife and I, and yeah, I mean, I, when I moved here, I moved here from New York city because I had gone to Columbia uh, for grad school. And I didn't really know much about Philadelphia other than, I guess, some of like the, the reputation that it has about being kind of a rough city and sports fans are, are obnoxious and so on, but it is really, really great city. And I, I really, really do, uh, like it um yeah my wife and I have been what years now we've been together 19 years more than that um she lives in South Korea so she's from South Korea she's living there but I, I visit Korea a couple times a year uh, I know my way around Seoul pretty much pretty well I can make myself and understood you can speak in Korean in an emergency yes yeah. <laughs> I can read pretty well uh which is I think like the the key skill um for like, you know, reading menus, reading signs, you know, not like reading books and certainly not oh, newspapers. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask you that because I'm oh, learning no, no, no. Chinese and then oh, yeah. I, I don't think I, I'm, I don't think I'm fluent enough, but the other day I bought a book of like a movie that I like, so. Yeah, well, I know uh, you could try for, you know, maybe like a young adults sort of thing and then read it along with a dictionary. And so that's been suggested to me, but we have a nephew in Korea, who is uh, 12 or so now. And I remember a couple of years ago, looking at one of his books, you know, for like for little kids, and I couldn't understand all of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, maybe my reading skill is not good, mm -hmm. that good. But I can read signs and menus. Uh, so so that's that's pretty helpful. Yeah, yeah. when people speak to me, I, I don't usually understand. <laughs> or like, I'll get some of it. But if it's if it's not, like my mother-in-law, you know, if it's not my family or my mm. wife's family or anything, then it's just easier to pretend I don't understand or speak anything. Um, but where were you born in, and where did you grow up? I uh, was born and grew up in Connecticut. My brother, who's four years younger than I am, and my dad still live in the same house where I grew up. So they've lived there since 1979. And so they're like my niece is her room used to be my room, you know, 30 years ago or more. But I see the, the difference between their childhood and, and ours. So when we were growing up, certainly in the 80s, the, the two big differences are there were a lot of kids our age in the neighborhood. And now there's not a lot of other kids in the neighborhood their age. And then also in the 80s, like, you know, we didn't have the internet. And we, yeah, you know, we have like video game console sorts of things, but certainly didn't spend as much time on screen as you know, my nieces and nephews do now. So I, in retrospect, I feel like we were fortunate in that regard that there was a lot of like, outdoor space for us to play in. There were a lot of kids in our neighborhood. Though so when I was in high school, my parents divorced. And so when I decided to go to college, I, I think like a lot of people, you just kind of like get away. I guess I thought that I wanted to live in a big city because like growing up in the suburbs, it just felt like 
to me, oh, there's there's more out there and there's mm-hmm. and all that, which is funny because now I have lived in big cities and now I'm like, eh, maybe it's enough. <laughs> like, I mean, I love yeah. Philadelphia and all, but sometimes it's you know it's too noisy or too crowded. And, I know, uh, and and so on. But you know, I could walk to the grocery store. I could, I'm going to meet a whole bunch of friends this afternoon and at this uh, outdoor you know bar thing, and it's like right down the street, and it's mm-hmm. great. So there's certainly trade offs. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good thing because you work at Swatmore and you work at Bryn Mawr before. So it's still in the separate area. You can still walk around. Yeah, absolutely. And both of those campuses are really beautiful. And Penn Campus is also really beautiful. It's nice to be able to go to those places. That's for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you went to Columbia to get your degree. Right, PhD. But like yeah. PhD, but like before that, where did you go to yeah, college? Yeah, right. So I wanted to go to uh, college in a city. And I applied to a whole bunch of places like everybody does. And so I ended up going to Columbia for my freshman year of college because I thought, you know, so it's not too far away. New York City is not too far away from my hometown. I did not like it. I was not ready for college. I was, Mm. and it's only kind of like in recent years of reflecting on growing up and, and all that. Like I was just like not, yeah, emotionally ready to go to college and to deal with all the stuff that you do when you're living on your own and in kind of in that environment. I did really well academically and I had some friends, but I think the pressure of like the academic pressure that I was feeling from everybody around me, I did not like. And uh, there's like a lot of drama on, you know, as, as you know, on Mm. like the dorms Uh, also New York city at that time, that was 1991 was Mm. not, this was before, kind of cleaning up places like Times Square and and so on. So I got mugged twice Mm. in New York and, um, and then decided like, this is not the right place for me. I I can't do this. So by the time I decided I wanted to leave, it was pretty late in the academic year. So my options were maybe take a year off or at least a semester off and then apply for the next cycle. Uh, But the only school that I was interested in there, I could still apply was Boston university, which I had applied to, um, out of high school as well. And have been admitted, you know, maybe it wasn't quite the school that I thought I was going to go to coming out of college. I mean, mm. surely like a lot of 19 year olds, you know, you're like, you're an Ivy league school. Columbia is an elite yeah. school. And then Boston university has, to be honest, has the reputation of a safety school, certainly in the Northeast, maybe let's go for one year and then try to go somewhere else. And then one of my friends made a crack about like, you don't want to be one of these kids who goes to a different college every year or something. Oh, you ended up staying. Um, so like I did stay at Boston home. University and I got, yeah, I graduated from BU. You know, it's what you make of it. Right. And so I, um, well, to, to some extent, it's what you make of it and some mm-hmm. factors you can't affect. You know, I did like an international co-op, like work experience sort of thing. That was great. I met like great friends. I, I really like, I really like Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nice to be close to like my aunts, my grandmother at the time. And uh, so it all worked out okay, but it was a tough decision, of right. course, to to yeah. leave. And to be honest, I don't usually tell people that I um, transferred. And I, I regret that I don't like to tell people because when I do meet students who are transfer students, I, I will often tell them because I know it's really hard. And yeah. I, I know it's really hard to be a transfer student. And mm. it's hard to make that decision. It's hard to start over. You're like, oh, my God, like I got to right. start over and be a yeah. first year, essentially, you know, again. Mm-hmm. And, but yeah, it, it is hard. And at this point, it's like, what does it matter? It, you know, now this mm. was over 30 years ago, I understand that it is really hard for, for people to, to be yeah. transfer students and to make that decision to, but to it's leave. Not, but I, I think it's not just limited to transferring schools. It's all, could it, well, it's relatable to me right now where hmm. it's like, oh, I might change jobs. You know, I think, right, right, right. I think it's the same. Yeah. So when you made that decision, did, well, did you end up getting a gap semester and then apply for this? No, I think I'm going to say, uh, it was probably like April or mm-hmm. March. So I figured... I would be a pretty strong transfer student, like, mm-hmm. like applicant. Like I, I, I made the Dean's list at Columbia. I had like a 3.9. So the only school that I was interested in that seemed realistic that had an application deadline that hadn't passed yet was BU. You know, in my mind, and I think it's uh, like a lot of young people, you're like, I have, this is my plan. 
my plan is I go to college, you know, I, I go to high school, I graduate in four years. And then I go to college and I graduate from that same college in four years. And then I get mm-hmm. a job. And then, you know, and, and then some people are like, for a few years, yeah, I stay in that day. job for, for, yeah. And I meet the person I'm going to marry in college and which was not something I thought of, but certainly, you know, people do think that way. So like deviating from the plan is not <laughs> like, it's not something it wasn't in the plan. With. Yeah, it wasn't in the plan. Yeah. And it's ironic that I say that because I mean, later on, we'll surely talk about my anxiety, but like deviating from the plan still at 50 years old is like, makes me like scratch myself. Like, like it, it's just like, if things don't go according to plan, it, like big picture or small picture, it's like really difficult for me. But it's funny that, that like, that is not the first time like deciding to transfer was not the first time that things did not go according to plan. Certainly my parents getting divorced was not part of the plan. Mm-hmm. And, and, and over the past 30 years since then, like many other things not going according to plan, but I guess <clears throat> that's life, right? You know, like you, you can't always have things going according to plan. So, so that was really tough. And again, I understand for so many students, that's like where you go to college is so defining mm-hmm. to you. When I met people at BU as a transfer student and they found out I had gone to Columbia, the assumption is you failed out. Right? Mm-hmm. The assumption is that you you took a step backwards in academically, and so something must be wrong with you. And then sometimes I would make up things like, oh, it's a financial reason, or I want to be closer to you know my grandmother or something. But if I, you know, if I knew people, it's and certainly when I came to terms with it myself to be like, you know what, it just was not, I was not happy there. I was, Mm. you you know, it was just not the right place for me. I felt like I couldn't leave campus. Mm. And, you know, the Columbia campus is uh, literally gated. It is, Mm. you know, a couple square blocks and it is literally gate. And I felt like I could not leave that Mm. because I was scared to, Mm. to go out into the city and, but unhappy, like in, you know, in the dorm and, Mm. and, and so on that, that, worked out fine, I Mm. I guess. And then, you know, uh, then the fact that I went back there for grad school, uh, that would have been nine years after I graduated from college. I don't know if it was like something in my mind that was like, I, you know, I want to prove to myself that I could do it it. or, Mm. you know, I don't like, I mean, if I had been admitted to other graduate schools, Mm. I probably would have gone to those instead. But uh, the Columbia was like the best, you know, option for me of the ones I got admitted to. So, so I, you know, I enjoyed it much, 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 much more the second time around. That is for Mm -hmm. sure. After I had gone to BU and graduated from BU, then, um, yeah, then I went and worked in industry in, in software development industry. I never really had a job as a quote unquote software engineer. In fact. Oh, really? Wait, so what was your first job right, right after? Yeah. My first job right out of college was at digital equipment corporation, which, um in like the 60s and 70s was a was the the microsoft if you will of the 60s and Mm -hmm. 70s by the early to mid 90s they were starting to sort of be overtaken but they they were hardware and software company i was part of a software development team i was kind of doing technical marketing i was kind of doing backline tech support so we had like corporate customers who were using this software and then if they had a problem, they would call like the tech support. And if they couldn't figure it out, they would contact me. And then, and then I would work with the developers to figure out like what was happening. So in the mid nineties, digital equipment corporation, uh, they started to sell off parts of the company and then have parts get acquired. And then that company, it doesn't exist anymore. Then they started to lay people off and they told me you're going to get laid off. And because you've only been here a year, you're, you're going to get nothing basically. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're like, you should look for a job. And at that time, there was a pretty big startup scene in Boston. I ended up joining a startup. I don't even think I knew what they did for the first couple of days I worked there. I knew it was something with Java, which was new at the time, mm. or more or less. Or, and uh, I knew something with the internet. And it was 30 people or so, mm. I guess, technically hired as uh, QA uh, and testing. But I also did some like technical marketing and review and documentation and mm. um, some sales type stuff, managing the website, things mm. like this. So, you know, everybody has to do a little bit 
of everything. Of everything. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really cool experience. Uh, the company grew after two years. I got relocated to the San Francisco office. I stayed there for one year. I didn't really like San Francisco as much as I thought I would. <laughs> uh, and then I moved, relocated to the London office and I worked there for like a year or so. Uh, during that time, the company went public and that was really exciting. That was 1999, I'm going to say. And that, it was rewarding too, because there were times, like, like a lot of startups, there were times where we didn't get paid. So in 1997, you know, we, we would go like two months without getting a paycheck mm -hmm. and because they just didn't have cash to pay us. Uh, so what they, what these companies do is they give you more stock, but, you know, fortunately I'd saved enough or could live poorly enough that I, I could go a couple months without a paycheck, you know, and they, they make it up eventually. Yeah. The company grew to over 2000 people. It was crazy to see the, the company grow from when I first started working there. Like we would literally, the whole company would go to, to happy hour, you know, mm. cause there's only 30 of us and mm. to the point where then when it gets 2000, like you. You don't even, you can't possibly know everybody at the company anymore. So I worked there in London for a year or so, kind of got tired of it. Not so much tired of it, but I, I wanted to do something different. So I started working at a company in London mm. as a, I guess, kind of as a software, de well, not really a software developer, kind of a manager slash software architect, software design mm. sort of thing. So like more of a high level, like how do these things get put together? Yeah. rather than actually implementation, though sometimes I'd have to implement stuff. But uh, that didn't go quite as planned either. <laughs> so it took like seven weeks for me to get a work permit. In that time, the person who hired me quit. And then the company signed a contract with a client that was going to cause us, the company, to actually lose money. And it was like a very, very bad business agreement. And there's like a huge mistake in the contract but they couldn't get out of it. We had to lay people off. And because I was the manager, I had to lay people off. Mm. Well, because I had just been hired and because I'm not in this, everybody there was practically everybody there was uh, English except for me. We had like an open mm. office plan, like desk, you know, open space for desk. People would steal stuff from my desk all the time. But that, you know, that's like when the dot-com bubble was starting to burst, like 2001. So then mm. after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to take some time off and I'm going to look for something something new so i was living in london with my girlfriend at the time and uh she broke up with me mm -hmm. so at that time i had no girlfriend no job nowhere to live because we were living together and i couldn't mm -hmm. afford to live there by myself i mentioned that our company the startup had gone public i didn't understand the tax implications of all of my stock option stuff i ended up paying like two hundred thousand dollars in taxes or something or it's like this crazy amount. And mm. I had that much money, but not a lot more than that. What happened was like the stock had gone up like this. I had purchased, exercised the shares at this point, which mm. means I had tax liability at this point. Then the, the stock price went down. When I sold them, mm. I still had the tax liability on the, the value when I purchased them, not mm. when I sold them. And, you, you know, I heard the people who had like, had like millions of dollars of tax liability, um, but did not have millions of dollars. So I guess I was lucky it was like an order of magnitude less and that I did have that money. Yeah. And then there was a September 11 terrorist tax mm -hmm. uh, of 2001. So not a great time. So anyway, I traveled for like six months because I still had money left. I went to South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. I never really done like the backpacking thing, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of young people do. Um, so that I was 28 at the time. So that was kind of my experience of just getting away from reality and going from place to place and and all that when i started to think i i need to have a job <laughs> mm -hmm. um and make money someone i was traveling with said oh you can go to asia and uh teach english and there's a lot of jobs there and you can make money and and i had not been to asia and uh i liked traveling and so so that's where how i ended up in south korea so in, in 2002 uh, I went to South Korea to teach the Princeton Review, like test prep. Um, and I was teaching high school kids like uh, SAT prep. I really did not like it at first. Mm -hmm. um, over time, I did start to like it. I was only going to stay three months, but then I didn't really have anywhere to go. And then mm -hmm. a couple of the other um, foreign, you know, Western teachers were like, well, they offered us full-time jobs, you know, we think we're going to stay. And then they, the Princeton Review offered me a full-time job teaching GRE. 
was like, okay, I'll, I'll stay. So I ended up staying two years and, you know, towards the end, I really, 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 really liked it. And so mm-hmm. that was a really good experience towards the end of the second year. I was happy, but it was like, well, I don't want to do this forever. Yeah. And uh, I like teaching and people tell me I'm good at it, but I kind of want to get back into computing. Um, mm. And so that's why I decided to go back to grad school. I wasn't totally sure when I started grad school that I would do a PhD and teach. So I started out as a master's student at Columbia. Mm. And because I did think like, maybe I'll earn a master's degree and then go back into industry. But when I interviewed at companies, it just was like, uh, I don't really want to work at these companies including a company that you're very familiar with, uh, where I was like, I do not want to work at this company. Uh, you know, and then it was like, well, I could go back to doing kind of the same stuff I was doing because I had this network of all these people I had known and met through all these travels and working at the startup. And, uh, but I didn't want to kind of go back. It was like, well, then why did I go to grad school to be, basically be doing the same stuff I was doing six years ago mm. or, or whatever. While I was in grad school, I, I TA'd a couple of times I don't remember. I don't think I had a chance to teach a class, but I had TA'd and I was like, oh no, I really, really like this. Yeah. So I was able to stay and do a PhD and here we are. Mm-hmm. So, but you wouldn't know that you like teaching if you did not go to South Korea. Before we, we started recording, right? We I was saying yeah. that like, you know, I was making a joke that you should get a master's degree to teach <laughs> and you said you didn't want to do that. And I said, you know, when I was your age, I didn't want to do that either. Like when I was in college, uh, undergraduates didn't have at BU at the time, didn't have the opportunity to be TAs, or at least not mm. that I was aware of. And uh, and I don't, I don't recall any of my TAs being undergrads. But we did have, I was in uh, Tau Beta Pi, which is the Engineering Honor Society, and we did tutoring. And anybody could come for, tut- and I, I don't exactly remember the details, it's been so long. But it was like certain classes that you could come and get help with. So I wasn't, you know, a TA specifically for data structures, but mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you could come and get help with these five mm-hmm. classes or, or something. And I really liked that. I really did like helping other people learn. And, and so anyway, when I was an undergrad, I didn't really think of a career as teaching. It was like, I want to make money and I want to work in industry and, you know, be in the software industry and so on. Yeah. But I, I did... Yeah, I did find that I liked teaching when I was in in Korea. I liked that that as a job, but grad school certainly like solidified that. Like I liked, you know, what qualified me to teach the GRE in Korea is the fact that I'm a native English speaker and I have a, <laughs> had at the time an undergraduate degree. Right. But that's it. Like I, I, you know, I was teaching like the GRE writing. Like there's mm. a, you have to write essays on the GRE. Like I'm not qualified to teach writing. <laughs> like like I, you know, I had a computer science de- degree when I was like, oh, teaching computer science, um, because I find it really interesting and challenging. And even people say like teaching intro, oh, it's easy to teach intro, but it's not really easy to to teach intro um, Mm -hmm. because there's so many different aspects of like what you're trying to do in terms of make the students feel confident and welcome and, and so on. But also like, how do you, how do I explain something to someone who's seen it for the first time that I probably saw for the first time, like literally 40 years ago. Yes. And so like, I find that aspect of it really rewarding and, you know, challenging. Mm. I had a really bad intro professor. And then afterwards I I took data structures, but I think the person or the professor for the first intro class is so important. Like how they teach it is so important because that's how students make decisions, right? I've, I've heard a lot of students at Bryn Mawr quitting CS just Mm. because they didn't like a specific intro class and the other day because my friend is interviewing for Harvard Dental School and in Mm. the interview they asked her how would you explain colors to colorblind people oh my god that's a hard question right yeah exactly it's things we take for granted and and also assume other people know or assume other people have you know this common Mm. common experience common background common interests mm-hmm. you know the colorblind mm-hmm. thing is an interest but like you know common experience and uh that's what makes it challenging so i did teach intro at in grad school so at columbia phd students had the opportunity to teach a class like as the instructor of record we say like not as a ta but like that is the instructor they give the grade they create mm-hmm. the class and you know and so on which is 
Uh, not really all that common. In fact, I think Columbia doesn't allow that anymore. And so I co-taught the intro class with somebody who's that I regard as my mentor for, in terms of teaching. And it was really, really, really great experience. But I know at that time, I was more focused on like the material. It, it was like, you know, here's the material. How do we deliver the material? And, and, you know, these notions of like making it challenging and making it difficult and, you know, not so far as like gatekeeping, not so mm. far as weeding out. I don't know that any, I'd like to think that there's no school that's intentionally gatekeeping or weeding out, but there's certainly ones that are not intentionally yeah. not doing it. Right. Yeah. And at, at that, you know, at that time, I don't think we really thought about it, like whether we were or were not, you know, weeding people out. But then when I taught, and I never taught intro at, at Penn. So in the 10 years I was there, uh, well, I, I mean, I kind of helped with it my first semester, but that doesn't really count. But uh, I never I never taught intro when I was there, but I did teach it at Bryn Mawr when I first started there. Yeah. And that was really exciting for me to, to teach intro. And at that time, that was 2020, that I was really thinking a lot about, you know, how do you make a class welcoming and not, you know, gatekeeping, not, mm. not weeding people out. Because yeah. I was under the impression from some of the people I had talked to um, that like the class, the intro class had a reputation mm. as being a weeder class. Yeah. And the downside is you never know, really, like you don't, you know, you know who stays in the department, you know, mm. who's, who ends up being a major, but you don't really know much about the people who leave. So it's hard to know, like, was it because of that class? Was it because of something else? Or is it because you discovered a love of biology and, you know, decided to major in biology, but it is a super important aspect mm. of the intro class. Right. And I, it, it saddens me when I see intro classes that are, that are yeah. not explicitly trying to make it welcoming. Um, I understand. Yeah. Because then, then you would just end up playing off of old stereotypes. And it's like, well, if you don't see yes. yourself as a computer scientist, when you get here, then you're not going to see yourself as a computer scientist when you're done with this class. You're going to feel like that's not an opportunity for you. Yeah. When before I took my first intro class, I had this like classmate and I was telling her, you know, like I I think I want to try taking an intro class. And then she said, mm. well, because back in high school, I did a lot of debating. People considered oh. me like a humanities kind of person. So even I myself thought that, oh, like I can only do social sciences. And so she said, you know, since you did um, humanities back in high school, you might find it hard because she was already like taking CS classes at that point. Well, she's she did not not end up to become a CS major. But yeah, it, I think it was kind of like, I wasn't sure myself, but then the classes weren't welcoming. And then some of mm. my friends were also playing along with the stereotypes. So then it ended up making me wow. feeling, I mean, I still ended up taking, trying to take it um, with Mai because Mai was taking it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, like the two of us can take it together. But if if it weren't for like, because Mai was also taking it, yeah. I don't think I would have taken it myself. What are some of the stereotypes that mm. other than, you know, like, oh, this is so difficult um, about CS that you often hear people talking about or like when they consider whether they should take it yeah a... well there's of course the stereotype that a job a computer science degree only helps prepare you to be a software developer you know i don't want to just be sitting at a desk coding all day or i don't want to just be in a room by myself coding all day i don't think that's really true i mean surely you have lots of meetings and you, you know in your job and uh you're interacting with people all the time like but i i think Going, you know, when you're a first year student, you're coming out of high school, maybe you don't really know about like that collaborative aspect of it. And I and I also will say that most intro classes, and including the one I taught for that matter, like do not dispel you of that notion. Mm -hmm. They they don't, I mean, maybe you tried a little bit, but um, they don't really address like computer science is a collaborative activity. N no significant advance in computer science or piece of software or whatever is developed by one person on their own, like maybe a couple of them by like Git and Linux, <laughs> like by this one person, but otherwise, you know, they're, they're developed by, by groups. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing, I guess two more, let's see if I remember them. One is all you do is code. So there's a, the, the, the fact that you're working alone and B, all you do is code. Yeah. Coding can be a big part of it, but there's, you know, other aspects 
to it, like, you know, I know that not everybody likes software testing, but I really, I wasn't really into software testing when I was in industry and I didn't really get into it until I was in grad school, but I, I do find it really interesting. I really like debugging stuff, but even things like user interface design and, you know, software architecture or into, you know, think about integration. There are all these different paths and all these different types of companies. I, the other day I spoke mm-hmm. to a student at SWAT, Swarthmore, who's looking for internships. And I said, like, you know, don't limit yourself to software companies. Like, I remember uh, one of your classmates at, at Bryn Mawr did an internship with the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team as a software mm. developer. And I like, I have a friend who works as a software developer uh, there. And like, you wouldn't think of the Phillies as hiring software developers. I remember when that guy, he's one of my former students from Penn, he, I ran into him and he's like, oh, I was looking for you. I, I landed my dream job. And I'm like, oh my God, please don't be Facebook or Google. Like, like <laughs> nothing wrong with Facebook and Google, but I, I, I yeah. don't know that people should be describing it as their dream job. Mm-hmm. Maybe some exceptions. But then he said like, oh, I, you know, I got a job with the Phillies. I was like, oh my God, I knew he really liked baseball. He's from Philadelphia. Mm. So it was like, oh my God, like so amazing. Yeah, totally. And then the third thing, is like the stereotype is that the field of computer science is unwelcoming. And like, so this is like a, you know, and unfortunately, you know, to some extent that stereotype is is true. Mm. But I think when students feel like the field is unwelcoming, I don't see people who look like me in the field, they are likely to self-select out. And I totally understand, like, like, well, of course you would. The folks have been, you know, for a while now, have mm-hmm. been trying to actively address, but it feels like, it's not always addressed by everybody. It's not like not every intro class uh, right. speaks to actively address that. Yeah. And adding on to that, I think there's yeah. um, a lot of people texted me on social media, actually, like random people, because I shared that I did not take a, like, I'm not like, I did not come from a science background or any sort of mm-hmm. like special program in high school. The common thing is they are afraid that if they take, if they major in CS, then they have to have some sort of preparation before coming to college. Right, 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 oh, right, right, right. That's a good one. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good one. That's also a, a big stereotype. I hadn't thought of that. I'm glad you said that. That stereotype needs to be explicitly addressed by the instructors. Yeah, that, that's actually a big a big stereotype that people, especially a place like Bryn Mawr, or mm. any, probably any liberal arts college, but certainly a mm. historically women's college. And, and it doesn't take a lot, I think, for that, stereotype to be reinforced by by an instructor who you know going back to where we started was like we'll say like well I'm sure you must have seen this before like you know but Mm -hmm. like well why would they have seen this before you know and uh, whether it's like using a certain tool or terminology like that sort of thing kind of will make a student who already thinks I don't belong here Mm -hmm. feel like well I don't know what that meant Mm -hmm. was I supposed to know what that meant does everybody else know what that meant? You know, you, you have to be really conscious about it as the instructor of an intro class. And also one of the challenges is that you have a quote unquote intro class that's designed for students with no prior background, but you'll get students in that class who do have prior background because mm-hmm. they don't have enough background to waive that class or skip it. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of in this in, in between state. And so they'll come in, they have some experience and the other students have zero Mm -hmm. and you're trying to teach to the students with zero experience and then I I did have a student in that class who had prior experience who would ask questions in class and I even though I had said like Mm -hmm. this class is for people with no background if you do have background please be conscious of the questions that you're asking but not everybody thinks that way all the time Mm -hmm. and so uh, that student would ask questions about like oh well what if you you know isn't this the same as this or isn't this like, doesn't it work like this? And I would always have to remember, you know, I think like there are some instructors who would be like, hey, I'm really excited that you know about this stuff and let, let's geek out mm. on this. And mm-hmm. then not realize that everyone else in the room is like, this what is are they talking about? Was I supposed to know this already? And so I did have to say, you know, to that student, like, don't do that yeah. <laughs> anymore. But if you don't address it, yeah, I think the students will, will mm-hmm. feel like, was I supposed to know this already? The learning curve can be really steep in the intro class. Programming, especially in languages like Java, but most programming languages are unforgiving because Mm -hmm. it's very detail-oriented. When you make mistakes, the the errors you get are not always helpful, (laughs) right? If you're a novice. 
so it can it can get really frustrating really quickly and if you feel like i don't you know i don't belong here i don't see anyone who looks like me i don't belong here i don't understand you know was i supposed to know all this why does everybody else seem to know all this mm. then you're you're going to self select out right right so then um in your job as a professor um what are your priorities when it comes to teaching cs classes yeah so i have this uh diagram that i worked on over the years that kind of reflected my teaching philosophy and mm -hmm. um the idea is that there are four things that i i try to balance and the, the balance will be different for every class and for every student in fact but there's this balance between like the knowledge that I'm trying to get, I was almost said transfer, but it's not always transferring, but it's the knowledge I'm getting, trying to get them to acquire. Sometimes mm. it comes out of this and sometimes it's from doing assignments and looking stuff up on their own and, and all that. And, and that relates to like the learning objectives of like, what are the things I want them to do, be able to do mm. at the end of the class? Mm. Uh, then there's the wellness. That's the second thing. How would they learn things if they're unhealthy or if it's causing them undue? stress. And so I think about that a lot uh, because it, it comes out in like policies, it comes out in, you know, behavior and what I say in class and treating students and not hundred percent perfect at it, but, uh, but I do try to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Then there's the inclusion and feeling welcoming. That's the third aspect of it. As I almost said, like this semester I'm teaching software engineering, it's mostly mm -hmm. juniors and seniors. By this point, they're already in the major, <laughs> like, like they're, they, you know, it's too late for them. But I still want them to feel included and, and welcome. And I'm sure there are students, in fact, I'm quite sure there are students who do not, who, who are like, well, I'm a computer science major, but I still don't really feel like a computer science major, you know, or I'm majoring in computer science, but I'm not a computer science major. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last aspect is, is to get them to think about like the impact, like the social impact of, of what they're learning. Mm -hmm. That is a definitely an area of growth for me. I, I don't really spend a lot of time on it, um, but it is something I'm kind of aware of. Right. So, so those are the four things that I, I try to figure out, like the right balance. Mm, okay. Um, I wouldn't want to go too deep into like the policies in class, sure. but I do want to touch on the fact that I think it seems like you reflect on yourself a lot sure. over the years right. <laughs> as an educator. In my opinion, you're a lot more approachable than many other professors in other universities Thanks. or educators that I've met. In Asian countries, there's more of like a top-down kind of like dynamic. Yeah. And here, equal, I, it's not top-down, I, I wouldn't say equal. I, it's not top-down, but it's also not like close connection. So that's why I was right. really scared to even like talk to professors. I, I right, was scared right, to right, talk right. to you, to Deepak, to everyone right. before, um, especially after coming back from COVID. Yeah. Um, so how do you make yourself accessible to students? Right. Yeah. I will say before I answer that question, I feel like I have to acknowledge, you know, a certain sense of privilege in being a generally healthy, white, middle-aged male. Right. Mm. And so what I'm about to say is not going to work for, for everybody. Mm. Um, and, and when I have tried to, express whether in like in writing or like like blog posts or or whatever or in conferences or something like i realize like not everybody can afford to be vulnerable to their students so i'll, I'll acknowledge that but I, I think what has worked for me i like to think that there's like mm -hmm. a general sense that that i as the instructor care about you as a person and as a student you, you know and that comes about in the um, the policies, now you said you didn't want to get into policies too much, but even just like a, a really simple one is right now, my late policy is if it's going to be late, tell me how late and that's mm -hmm. fine. You mm -hmm. know, so I give students flexibility and I think like students appreciate that and they're like, oh, that's a concern, you know, for me as a person so that I'm not, you know, stand up all night to finish this thing or, or, or working super hard to finish this thing. And so that I can do well in the class and but also like being willing to meet with students. I try to answer emails quickly or you know, messages quickly, especially if I think the student is maybe in, not even like being in distress or anything, but it's like, if you're working on something and you email me, it's nine o'clock at night 
and I happen to see it, I know you're working on it. And I understand this is where we're going to get to eventually is boundaries. But like, I know if I don't answer that email, then you're probably not going to like, maybe not going to be able to make any progress on it. And then until I look at email again the next morning or something. And, and so mm-hmm. I, I try to you know answer students quickly or be willing to meet with students if they want to talk to me about stuff. And I think that that gives the students the feeling of like, oh, this is an instructor who cares about, you know, again, me as a person and, and me as a student. Lately in the past six years or five years, I've been more open about like mental health challenges. And again, I recognize that not everybody, that's not going to work for everybody. Uh, and I don't recommend it to everybody, but it works for me to be open about my mental health challenges. And I think like, like that helps you know, students to feel like, okay, this is somebody I can talk to because they have, you know, maybe similar experience or mm. it could be more like empathy, have empathy about it. So yeah. when I first started teaching, like I remember my very first semester teaching at Penn, I remember having my first midterm exam that I had created. And I remember saying to one of my colleagues, like, I want that exam to be so hard. I want them crying at the end of the exam. Mm. And now I, if one of my colleagues said that to me, I would I would never really punch anybody, but I would punch that person. <laughs> but like, how the hell, why would you do that? To, yeah. But the, I get that new faculty think that way because like we just went through it as graduate students ourselves. Mm. You know, and I, I guess like you're really, perhaps when you're younger or new to teaching, you're really concerned about like, how do students think about you? And do students respect me? And I'm not their friend. I'm the boss, you know, kind of like thinking hierarchically. And I know that many of my colleagues even now still think that way. And that's, that's okay. Like that's, that's how they think that's like the relationship that they want, because I really do think that they think like, that's what's best for the students yeah. and like, kind of like, whether it's a tough love, you know, discipline. So I do think like many, most faculty are coming at it from a place of like, this is what I think is best for the students. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know that wanting them to cry after the exam is what's best for the students, but at that point, I guess I, I felt like I wanted them to respect me or to think I'm smart. But over time, I definitely softened on that. Wow. And I mean, right now, like my class, we have a mid-semester feedback form. And one of the questions is like, is there anything in this class that's causing you undue stress? Because mm. I don't, like I come up with policies and ways of teaching that I think are not causing them undue stress. Like you're going to have stress you know, doing these assignments because that's how you learn, but, yeah. but undue stress, unnecessary levels of stress. But I, I do try to uh, be conscious mm. about that. Right, right. I think it's rare to find adults who own up to what they, because I can see that you were embarrassed by what you said back then. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, and to me, I find that really inspiring. I am curious about something, which is that I think a lot of people um, struggle in secret and in silence just because the people around them might not tell them oh like I'm also struggling with this or like a similar or different thing but when you walk into class and when you introduce yourself and you said oh I'm I'm seeing a therapist so you can you can seek for help if you need to I think it unconsciously made people felt more at ease with asking for help why do you think it's important for you specifically and then for other educators to be open or model like vulnerability right. to young people? I think it's a, it's a question of, you know, we say like meeting them where they're at. I mean, this is not a direct answer to your question, but one thing I hear from colleagues is like, well, when I was in college, you know, we didn't talk about this stuff. So a couple of things like a, the people who are saying that are the people who toughed it out stayed through, earned a PhD, and are teaching at a, you know, an elite institution, right? Like, those are my colleagues. So when I hear that stuff, and it's like, well, of course, I'm not expecting all of my students to become professors at Bryn Mawr, you know, or Penn. I'm not expecting any of them to do that, to be honest. And I'd be thrilled if they did, but, but, but that we can't hold that as the standard. So that's one thing. But also, you, you know, times have changed and people have changed and the expectations have changed. When I hear people talk about like, well, when I was in college or 10 years ago, students weren't like this or whatever. Like, no, 10 years ago, they were not like this. And 10 years from now, they will not be like this because, you know, pandemic and who knows what's going on in the rest of the world in the next 10 years. Yeah, 
things do change. And so it is a question of like meeting students where they're at. And I, I do feel like there's a rising number of students, especially at a place like Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, but even at Penn, who are looking for whether it's an adult role model or, or someone in the field as a role model or someone they can talk to that they feel they can approach. And I don't think when I, again, this is just one person, but 30 years ago, I don't think that I was like, I want to have a relationship with my professor. Like I want to, you know, get to know my professor, but I don't even think like these were discussions that we even thought of at the time. But now I know that there are students for whatever changing reasons over time that they want somebody who is, Mm. uh, is approachable. So I guess two things. And there's also more of an open dialogue among young people about mental health. Absolutely. There's a more of a dialogue about it now, and certainly even more than like seven or eight years ago. So I think it is kind of like the right place at the right time Mm -hmm. for me being comfortable, like even being aware and having the right vocabulary to talk about my mental health Mm. and to be in a position where I'm comfortable talking about it. Yeah. And a group of students who wants that out of an instructor. And Mm -hmm. then the last point is that that group of students, I think, who wants to have an approachable instructor are the ones who do not ordinarily feel welcome in computer science. So this is not just about me being approachable. It is also me trying to make those students feel welcome. So it's a broadening participation Mm -hmm. or inclusion issue as well for me, because I know that the student, you know, students will say, oh, Professor Murphy's really approachable. I really like talking to him or I feel comfortable talking to him. But students come into my office and we talked about how I noticed that the student changed her hair color. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. And I talked, told a funny story about trying to change my hair color this past summer. And then we talked about her cat. Then we talked about scary movies, which I do not like, but she likes scary movies. And I was trying to tell her why scary movies are terrible. Those are the conversations that I'm having with students because those are the conversations I think the certain students want to have. And I don't think they're finding anyone else in computer science to have those conversations with. Mm, right. But life. if you want, right, right, right. But if you want to talk about chat GPT or you want to talk about this Python library or something, there's plenty of faculty who will mm. talk to you about that. And I'm not saying I'm the only person that they can talk to, but there's not a lot of, yeah. of people. No. Mm. Why do you think there's that kind of distance between right. most professors with the students and and the fact that you are trying to like not like close that distance, but have right. a different kind of boundary? Yeah. So boundary is the key word here. So I think there's two reasons. One, I think there are, there are faculty who uh, are intentionally setting boundaries. And then there are faculty for whom it wouldn't even occur to them to be available to have a conversation about scary movies and hair color and cats, Mm -hmm. Um, or that they wouldn't even be able to carry off that conversation. (laughs) Like, you know, you know, the first couple of reasons, you know, when I do talk about my connections, relationships with students, with colleagues, there's the boundaries in terms of like the amount of time that you're willing to spend Mm. And, you know, when we started talking, I said, like, I don't really do much other than work. And so, you know, the other day, one of your friends texted me with a work related concern at like 1030 at night. And I'm like, I can talk right now if you want. Mm-hmm. And so we talked on the phone at 1030 yeah. at night, like glad I did that. And I, and it, again, I, did, I could have waited till next morning to reply. But in my mind, it's like, well, then she's going to be worrying about this, you know, thing. And it's like, texting me at 1030 at night, then probably wants to talk about it. But I understand that some people would be like, no, like you have to have time boundaries. Mm. You can't be working all the time, can't be available all the time. And that's burned me sometimes. But then the other thing and the bigger thing maybe is just like the boundaries of how how much you get involved in the students' lives, how much you allow the students to know mm. about your life. And obviously there's like the academic reasons, right? Mm. So mm. You know, if a student is in your class and you're creating them, but even... Afterwards, I, I think there's the faculty might set the boundaries of like, I don't want to be too involved in your life. And I don't, you know, I'm not your friends and whatever. And I think this pr- protects themselves yeah. uh, and maybe to protect the student as well, because if something goes wrong or, or feelings are hurt, then it can maybe do more harm than good. And then right. 
I'll, I'll just say that I realize I'm not always sure where the boundary is with connections with students mm. and especially, yeah, with students and alums. I have absolutely been hurt. Some probably students have been hurt and quite sure of it uh, through, you know, through that. And that, that can be hard. And I, I feel bad about that. Um, mm, mm. But I think that that's the trade off, you, you know, like with any. When you make yourself any, more available. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any friendship, right? You you mm. start dating somebody and you, you know, there are like only a couple of possible outcomes. And one of them is you guys breaking up. <laughs> right. And so, so like, you know, you, that's the risk you, you take. And sometimes it doesn't, doesn't work, but I, I do think the majority of times it works out. Okay. But it's, mm -hmm. But I realize again, it's not for everybody, and it's, and yeah. they, they may say like, you know, I'll, I'll teach these students, and then, but that's that's it. Right. Um, I have a follow up question. Yeah. About this, because you mentioned that, like, ten years ago, you were like, oh, I want to make the students cry. Right. And now you're talking about cats and and scary movies. <laughs> right. Um, was there like a particular switch as to like? Hmm. That like a particular thing that made you make that switch or was it like gradual where process where you suddenly just started prioritizing students wellness more? I think there were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of TAs that I had probably. So I started teaching at Penn in 2010 mm -hmm. and, um, you know, certainly for the first like five years or so I was about, you know, I want students to respect me and I want my class to be really hard and all that. And you know, I wasn't a monster, uh, you know, I'm still essentially had the same values as I do now, but it was just maybe coming out differently. But around 2014, 2015, I had two TAs and they were really good friends with each other. And so the three of us, and they were helping me. So in my software engineering class, I have, as you know, this role of a project manager uh, who helps students with their projects so that I can distribute some of the work. And these two were the, like the original project managers. And so we were kind of creating the role and I spent a lot of time with them, you know, like creating the role and working on this role. But then, you know, it's like, oh, well, why don't we go for coffee or why don't we go to the, you know, the ice cream place or go to donuts or, or something? Oh, there's a really good cupcake place at Penn at the time. So we would do that. And then I, I guess like that started making me like get to know and like the students especially undergrads. And also they're, the two of them are women. And then it made me kind of thinking more about like their place within computer science at, at Penn. If I could personify who helps with that transition or mm -hmm. around when did it happen? It was probably around that time. I do think though um, there, was, there was probably two other, I can't remember the timing, but I'll tell you, one was the Grace Hopper Conference, the you know, world's largest gathering of women and non-binary technologists. And I had, and you, which you know, because we, uh, we went together. together. And uh, I, I went four times, I think, when I worked at Penn. And one of the times I was there, I had this kind of revelation. My revelation was like, maybe our job is to, to do like diversity inclusion. And then we teach our classes to keep our jobs at Penn in the mm -hmm. same way that sometimes research faculty, like tenure track faculty, like the research is their job doing research, publishing, pu you know, graduating PhD students, getting grant money. Like that is their job. And then they teach in order to stay employed at the university of Pennsylvania or wherever. Right. And then I was like, maybe that's how we should approach our jobs mm -hmm. is because our responsibilities were just teaching, but maybe what we're really doing our contribution to whether it's the broader computer science or just at Penn mm -hmm. is DEI initiatives. And then we teach. And, and I started to think of it that way. I don't think like we ever formalized that or, or anything like that. Mm. Um, I think it was the following year I got a semester off from teaching and I had a chance to go to um, a couple of different events, like right out one right after another. One was a workshop about, like increasing enrollments and like, oh my God, what are we going to do with all these students? And what does this mean for diversity and inclusion in the field of computing? Then I went to Grace Hopper. Then I went to a conference on um, celebration of diversity in computing. So not just women in computing, but all sorts of diversity in computing. And that really also got me thinking about like, what, what is it that we're doing? That's where I really started to 
formalize this kind of like the four aspects of my teaching philosophy mm-hmm. and so on um, was through through those events and like through having that time to really think about like what what is my job right. and you know what am I doing beyond just helping students learn Java yeah. or whatever you know mm-hmm. and so ensuring students mental health and creating opportunities for diversity and inclusion how are you contributing to these initiatives like looking right. into the actions yeah fall 2018 was a semester I had off uh, from teaching and that's where I was like really like thinking a lot about this at that time I was trying to be involved in all the things mm. so I was so it, I was working at Penn at the time Penn has a women in computer science group so I was kind of unofficial faculty advisor for that, mm. but also they had like a ally, like an advocacy and allies group. And so I was involved. Then uh, I was trying to get an LGBT student group started in computer science. Unfortunately, never really took off. Uh, we had like three or four meetings. There just wasn't anybody to like lead it and, and yeah. really own it. Uh, but I was you know, trying to be involved in that. There was, this was maybe a little bit later, like 2019, 2020, like a little bit of like a student wellness group within the, the School mm-hmm. of Engineering. Mm-hmm. And so I was involved in that. So I was involved in a lot of these student groups primarily and and also trying to incorporate things into my class. At that time, I had like weekly or biweekly reading assignments about right. diversity and issues in software engineering and also trying to like, you know, model an inclusive community. So I would be intentional about hiring TAs so that I would Mm -hmm. have a diverse group of TAs because at that time probably had like a dozen TAs. And so I was trying to do all these different things and be involved in all of these different things uh, also. But after the pandemic, and then when I decided to to switch to Bryn Mawr, I had a conversation with a student who um, has no problem, you know, telling people what they think. And, um, Mm -hmm. and sometimes it can be a little bit too much honesty, but sometimes, you know, people need honesty and I forget what the conversation was about, but they said something to the effect of, you need to decide what's important to you, Like Mm -hmm. you need to decide what is your thing. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, and as much as I really do care about women in computer science, people of color in computer science, queer people in computer science, the mental health stuff hits home for me. Like that is uh, the thing that like personally affects me that I have most lived experience with because I'm not a woman, person of color, and I'm not queer. But as a person living with mental health challenges, that's something, you know, I can talk about. Mm-hmm. And and also, to be honest, there is not a lot of people doing work in that area. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want it to sound like I'm the only one by any stretch, but there's not like conferences about it like there are I for agree. women in computer science and, and diversity and LGBT and, and so on. So I felt like, okay, that's the thing I'm going to focus on. And having that focus has really helped me be more productive in, mm. in that area, I think. So I've been trying to do research. So in that area, you know, there's like awareness, advocacy, research, I guess. Maybe there's some kind of spectrum of that. But like, so I had tried to do like awareness and advocacy stuff, like writing things or trying to do talks at conferences or trying to do like discussion sessions at conferences. But I do think like real change in academia comes through research. And so trying to get involved in research around that. And so that's, that's been successful. I found a lot of good collaborators. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a paper that was written by a Bryn Mawr student Mm -hmm. uh, that I advised uh, that's going to be published and presented at the computer science education conference next March. You know, it's like a growing community of people who are interested Mm -hmm. in it. One thing I personally found really helpful for me was when I, we took the the software and society. Uh, yeah, software and society. Software yes, and yes. Society. Yeah. Yeah. So when we took that class, it was mostly like discussions, right? And then each team was assigned a topic or research their own topic. Right. What I found really interesting was when you not like requested, but su- well, yeah, you kind of requested mm. us to have like a language or like a a a document explaining what right, the right, right, terms right. that we should be using or what kind of language we should be right. using when we talk about, let's say, LGBTQ and right, right, um, right. 
in computer science right, right. or mental health. So I think I learned a lot from that. And Good. I can imagine that you as a professor, you have to keep kind of like updating your vocabulary yeah. awareness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think if you're going to be in this area, um, you need to be good at apologizing and you need to, you know, be okay with apologizing. And then I think like, that's what I was trying to do in that class. So we, we did have like a shared glossary, I guess we'd call it of, yeah. of terms. And even that, like I, I seeded it with some stuff and then uh, one of your classmates, you know, kind of corrected something and or brought up a, a point about something, you know, I do think like when I speak about things, I think people do feel like, well, I like to think that people feel like I'm doing it from a place of concern or, or mm. respect. And I'm mm. not using terms like intentionally incorrectly. Mm. And then there are people who are, who will like get angry at, at use of, of terms that are in, incorrect and, and maybe point out like you should educate yourself about yes. the correct use of those terms. And then, and I get that. Yeah. I think you have to be open to uh, the feedback and the criticism so that you learn and can do things better. And then there, there, are, there are certainly terms that I used and not like maliciously incorrectly, but it's like, well, that doesn't really mean that, or that doesn't really entail this. You know, you just have to have people around you mm -hmm. who are, who Keep are comfortable you telling you. And, yeah. yeah. You know, kind of like going back to the boundaries thing. Like if you're, if you position yourself as the approachable instructor mm -hmm. and people start to believe you're approachable, they will maybe be, more honest with you and open than about your class than you care <laughs> care to yes. hear you know yes. <laughs> um a couple of weeks ago like for our class i criticized a student and and that student was not happy about it and wrote me a very angry email and i felt really bad i, I realized like what i had i didn't i don't think i said anything really bad but i think i said something out loud that probably didn't need to be said out loud and um I felt really, really bad. I, I, but I also felt like it's good that the student feels like they can, you know, to you that directly with me. about it. Yeah, yeah. And right. I think that's actually um, a bit better than coming to another professor to talk about you <laughs> and what you did. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Usually, I'm the one that they come to talk about other professors to, yes. <laughs> which is uh, which is what I can be challenging. Well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, that thing ended up okay because that student, I think they were embarrassed that I had said something out loud and criticized them mm -hmm. uh, in front of other people. And then I, you know, I'm pretty good at apologizing, I like to think. And then the student came to talk to me uh, a couple of days later and uh, like apologized for sending that email and said they were like, I hadn't slept the night before and I was really on edge and I reacted. But like, I, I really like your class and I, I know you really care about us and, you yeah. know, we didn't intentionally like embarrass me. So I'm glad, you know, for all of those things, like I, like, I'm not glad that I embarrassed the student. Of course, I do feel bad about that, but I'm glad that they felt comfortable. Like I've created an environment where they mm -hmm. felt comfortable telling me that and that I could then apologize because mm -hmm. I know like some professors would never apologize to a yeah. student. Right. And then, then that student could then, you know, come back to me and say that they appreciate it. I think what know, matters is the fact that they came back, you know, eventually. Yeah, they I think so too. Back. Yeah. Yeah, I was really worried, like, what happens the next time we have lab? What happens the next time we see that person? Mm -hmm. I see that person. Like, love things. It's like, it's you know. like the first time I missed that meeting. And then... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> But I, I but, was unnecessarily angry at you for missing that meeting. That, well, but, but then again, now that when I think about it, there are people that I, I think it's just my personality when I just have no respect or no admiration, mm. then I wouldn't even appreciate, like I wouldn't even want to keep that connection or, or that relationship. Right, 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 but right. I think it was because that I really respected you and I admire you and I wanted to keep that connection. Like it wasn't too scary for me to go and and apologize. So and right. I still came back. So I think that was a I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do struggle to figure out how to use tough love or or frustration. And I, I admittedly am not always in control of my frustration. I think nobody is. Like in the lab in particular, I do get real really anxious when I think a lot of people are trying to get my attention simultaneously because mm. I, I want to be able to help everybody. And I'm not saying this out of like some 
like I'm trying to save everybody thing. It's just like how my brain works is like, I need to get to that person and that person. And I need to answer these questions quickly. And I, and I know like this has happened to me before, like in labs uh, where I would get frustrated because I just feel so anxious about, and it, you know, it's got control and fear and so on. And where I would snap at somebody. Yeah. And then, and this happens sometimes where it's like, how do I express frustration mm. or like, am I allowed to do it? You know, do I allow myself to get frustrated when someone forgets a meeting or mm. is like really late for a meeting or if I think that they violated academic honesty policy. So there was a, a case at Bryn Mawr where the student who I really liked, I felt had violated the academic honesty policy on an assignment and we had a conversation and I, it's like, how do I talk about this in the way where it's like, oh, Chris is the nice, mm. you know, approachable professor and he loves everybody. And, you know, and, and then it's like, but how do I, you know, insert mm. discipline or whatever. Yeah. And I think however it went, that destroyed that friendship, mm. that destroyed that relationship. And, uh, and I feel really bad about it. It wasn't worth <laughs> like destroying that relationship, but it is really hard when you, when you want to convey how serious it is mm. and uh and you know when it comes to like students being responsible for whether it's being on time for things or remembering mm. things or you know submitting things on time or following mm. academic honesty policies so there is a challenge and you have to kind of balance how much frustration do I exhibit and then what's the cost going to be because if it's a professor who you think is always angry all the time then it's kind of know, expected or is, or is, yeah right then you're not surprised when they lose it in class yeah. right yeah but if it's somebody who's like well this is supposed to be the nice friendly teacher who just embarrassed me mm. then it's like doubly painful and that mm. that was what this this thing that happens right more recently I was thought thinking about that too it's like oh my gosh like I just spent seven weeks trying to build up the reputation as the approachable professor and like who knows right. what this kid's going to do. They're going to put something on Instagram or something yeah. about how I, you know, and this, and then, so it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to manage. Hmm. I guess it's a lifelong process because it's, I, I think yeah. it's probably not just like a career issue. It's how you are portraying yourself and how you want people to perceive you. Yeah, certainly. And you know, I like to think I'm not just approachable to students. Like I am like this in real life. Like this, like, <laughs> you know, like I check in on my friends who are not, you know, my former students and I'm happy to listen to them uh, or give advice or, or whatever. And I, and make them, you know, when they have big life decisions, I try to be encouraging and, and so on. So uh, yeah, it's not just like a face that I put on class but you know in the same yeah. way like it doesn't it doesn't always work for for everybody mm. yeah yeah okay I just have a few questions left um and because sure. I'm very biased that I graduate from Bryn Mawr right uh, my question is because you taught at Bryn Mawr when I was there mm. what makes Bryn Mawr students different I I wouldn't force you to compare to other places I'm just yeah asking right you different well I'll tell you when people ask about the differences in teaching. I think I have three things. We'll see if I can remember all of them. Okay. So one thing that is not about Bryn Mawr students, so this is kind of a non-answer, but Bryn Mawr students typically take four classes a semester. Penn students might take like six or more. Swarthmore students, I think are supposed to take four, but I think a lot of them take five. And it it does make a big difference. And even though uh, taking four classes you, you still fill the time anyway with other stuff, right? It could be clubs, it could be, you know, social stuff, hobbies, you know, athletics, et cetera, jobs. But I think it reduces the stress that students feel because I think the courses tend to be the biggest stress inducer. And then also it gives the students more time to try to figure out things on their own. And that was a big difference for me that I noticed coming to Bryn Mawr from Penn is that at Penn, students, they would take a lot of classes. The assignments would be really hard. The students would not often go to class or read the material because they were like, I don't have to go to class. I have to do the assignments. Mm -hmm. So so they would then do the assignments, but they can't do the assignment because 
um, they haven't gone to class. Mm. So then what do they do? They try to go to office hours, but these classes are massive, hundreds of students. So there's 40 people mm. in office hours waiting to talk to the one poor TA. And that causes this like frustration in this downward spiral. I was very happy not to see that at Bryn Mawr. I found that students at Bryn Mawr often were more likely to ask for time than they were for help. And I, mm. and I worried that they're afraid to ask me for help and that either I'm not portraying myself as being welcoming and willing to help or that they, that they have a fear of asking for help generally. But I had then convinced myself that, that the Bryn Mawr students wanted to figure stuff out on their own. And and I feel like um, I'm seeing that swat also. You know, my my policies are always, you know, if you need more time, just tell me how much more time you need. And if it's reasonable, I'll say yes. Most students will ask for more time. There are a couple who ask for help regularly, which I, I like, including the one that I discussed hair color and scary movies with. And I, I think that's that's great because I think they probably need more help and they might not be able to figure out stuff on their own in a reasonable amount of time. So that mm. is... I don't know if it's, you know, something inherent to the Bryn Mawr students that they're more likely to ask for, they want to figure stuff out on their own or are less likely to ask for help. But that's one difference. The second difference is uh, I find that the Bryn Mawr students were much more supportive of each other and like happy to, to collaborate. Not everybody, um, but we're happy to, generally happy to collaborate, like willing to collaborate and you know we're supportive of each other uh academically and not competitive mm. and i know it's i guess it's written down that you're not supposed to discuss grades with your uh with your you know your classmates and maybe it's because like certain classes at penn are graded on a curve so you are competing with other mm -hmm. students and maybe it is part of the culture you know you don't discuss grades you don't ask you know, what's the average or, you know, talk, you know, et cetera. Some like people ask me about that. And my answer is always, it's just my impression is that there are mm. enough opportunities for everyone at Bryn Mawr. Like, for example, like a research, like a position in like a, a professor's mm. lab, you don't have to fight other people for it. Mm. Uh, at least right. for my friends, even for my friends who are doing biochem, it's like there are two or three labs and there are enough positions for people who are interested to 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 do it you know so i, I right, 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 that's right, right. my impression it's true yeah i think it's because it's you know smaller i don't know i like to think that the Bryn Mawr students are generally happy genuinely happy for each other <laughs> like yes, when yes. something good happens and it's yeah. not like you know comparing yourself in a negative way i mean you can't help mm. but to compare yourself yeah. right that's human nature but um but i, think I do think are, it's like, a culture thing happy. i don't know yeah. how or why we have that kind of yeah. culture, but it is definitely kind of like the environment. Yeah, certainly. And that's, you know, when I talk about Bryn Mawr students, it's because it's the type of people who would go to a college like Bryn Mawr, right? Mm. And the, the type of people who are looking for, like you probably yes. had some knowledge of that culture when you decided to, to go, if for no other reason than knowing it's historically women. So I think like the type of people who choose to go there are typically yeah. the ones who appreciate and, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of culture. Right. And then the third thing is, uh, so I did remember all three, <laughs> is specific to computer science students. I, I did, and it's sort of a combination of the first two. I did find that the computer science students I knew or who I saw through senior year, like how many of them came to Bryn Mawr intending to major in computer science? Like almost none, right? Mm -hmm. like, I can think of maybe one or two who told me they intended to major in computer science, but almost none. But I think that they they found that, you know, even though not every class is welcoming in the computer science department at Bryn Mawr, that they found enough of a community because they definitely have options, but they found enough of a community that they were like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. And I think every single one of them struggled at some point and probably was like, why am I doing this? Like, yeah, you know, I like, do. uh, yeah, of course. And you're supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be hard, but persisted and discovered something about themselves as opposed to other, you know, I can't say like all Penn students for sure. There are hundreds of them that I taught, thousands that I taught. But I think like the ones who were like, I'm going to be a computer science major, 
for, you know, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go work at Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. And um, everything else is just a bearer to me. I'm not going to learn anything in these classes. These are just boxes I need to tick. Mm. I have to get these things out of the way. Where I'm really going to learn is my side projects, you know, my internships, you know, things I might teach myself, but, but all of these other things, even, you know, the software engineering class, which is like the most applied one out of all of them, I would say students were, it's still or like, you're, it's just a barrier to me to getting what I want. Now, not all students think that way, obviously, but I can't imagine a Bryn Mawr computer science major thinking that way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's always, you know, they're always learning. They're always, mm-hmm. I want to know what's out there. And I, I yeah. realize that like, I'm being taught this because I will need it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Like nothing is wasted. I, I would say. You know, at the time, you're not like, oh, this is a waste of my time. Mm, you know, mm. like I would have students in my software engineering class at Penn tell me like, well, I did an internship, uh, you know, at such and such company and nobody does it that way. Mm. You know, the way I was like, oh, I'm sorry, because the three <laughs> months that you worked at Facebook, you're now the expert on this. And so that was kind of surprising. Um, mm. But so I, I do think the Bryn Mawr students appreciate their education. And again, yeah. it's not all the Penn students and, and all mm-hmm. yeah. And I do think that we want to figure things out on our own. Now that I graduated and I meet more people, I only realize like the difference in culture Mm. um, now. Well, specifically for me and my best friend, we identify Mm. ourselves as like straight. And I think as young women, it's not that we want to prove ourselves, but it's just Mm. that we want to do things ourselves. Like I don't like it when someone mansplain things to me. I don't like it when... When you need, so so I would rather be able to like challenge myself and if I really can't not do it, then I'll ask somebody. But I yeah, definitely I think that's the culture and that's what I really appreciate about Bryn Mawr. Hopefully more people try to apply to Bryn Mawr after watching these episodes. <laughs> do people have wrong assumptions about you before they really get to know you? And oh if gosh. yes, then what what are those? <laughs> I mean, going back to what we started talking about earlier, I I assume that students maybe feel like all professors have had the same journey and and a vast majority of them have. Like you started college knowing you were going to major in computer science, which I did not also. Maybe the assumption is all professors start out knowing they're going to major in computer science. They go undergrad, grad school, you know, become a faculty member and, and, you know, that's what they do. Um, but I think people are surprised when they find out that like I worked like after undergrad, they didn't just go right into teaching and also like, sir, are surprised, you know, certainly by the living in Korea and yeah. the, like, that's not really part of the the, the path for, yeah. for a lot of the faculty mm-hmm. they meet. Not a lot of people would be like, yeah, right. go to Korea and teach English when you had a degree in computer science from a good right, school right, right. and you're from you're American you know you know what I mean yeah it's funny you say that because remember I was saying before that when I was in grad school like I wasn't interested in any of these jobs in New York City at the time including a company that you're very familiar with the interviewer from that company that you are very familiar with Mm -hmm. said almost exactly that to me he looked at my resume so I have a piece of paper he looked at my Mm -hmm. resume and was like so you you worked at this company Mm. and then you decided to take time off and you were teaching English in Korea. Like what, what, I just don't get How it. do I make sense of this piece I of I just paper, don't get right? it. Yeah. And I was almost like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that like, you know, it's up for you to get my life decisions or, or something. But yeah, but I think that was the attitude of, mm. of lots of people in industry who are just like, don't understand that, you know, things happen. I do think that that's changed a lot past 18 years now but yeah I, I think that that is surprising in or it was surprising people in industry now I if people hear about that hopefully not any of my students feel like that's a bad thing I think it mm. makes me more of a real person and yeah with, you know different experiences and five years from now if not five months from now five years from now yeah and you will not be working at that company and it, that's because that's just the way it goes mm. right and uh like I just see this over and over with people and 10 years from now, you may not be doing computing and that's fine. Like 10 years from now, when you're still in your early thirties, you're still 
a baby, you know, and like, I know it feels like it's not, but you are, you still have all this other stuff that you can do with your, your life. But at least I, I had like kind of different experiences and everything. Yeah. Yeah. This was not the plan. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the plan was. Uh, <laughs> path 30. And final question. What is yeah. something you really wanted to do, but haven't had the opportunity to do too? And probably oh you're, you might plan or might not plan to do it anytime soon. No, <laughs> I no remember question on the plan. Yeah. When, when I graduated from college in 1995, there were two things I wanted to learn how to do. I wanted to learn how to rollerblade and I wanted to learn how to drive a car with a manual transmission. I do not know how to do either of those things. So those are still on the to-do list. Okay. I also had a lot of friends have a lot of friends who are musicians and in 1999 I bought a electric bass guitar and started to take classes and actually played uh like in a rehearsal space with some of my friends and enjoyed it so much started dating this girl didn't really have time for it moved to London blah 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 that guitar is sitting in my basement now hasn't been touched Mm. in forever yeah I think like those are kind of like the you know, the hobbies I never picked up or the yeah. the life skill I never yeah. picked up. Yeah. But it's okay. not too late. It's not too not too mm-hmm. late to learn things. It's never too late. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, it's it's uh like now that I'm in my early twenties. Sure. I'm so I think I'm so impatient with myself just because you know how like my brain is still developing and all of that. <laughs> right. And because I'm I'm a young woman and I'm like, you know, like I'm not telling, I mean, I don't tell myself I'm going to get married at this age. I'm going to do right. this and that at this age. But it's just that I, I know that it's, I have limited time before my brain fully develops. So I'm so impatient with myself with like, oh, I want to read all these books now. I want to mm-hmm. do all of this now. I want to absorb as much as possible before it gets, it takes a bit longer for me to learn something new. Uh, oh, I see. And so I think I'm having, it's not that I want things to be perfect. It's just that. I think that's part of why I'm like right now I'm so frustrated with the job mm-hmm. just because I'm not mm-hmm. learning about technicality, but I'm also not learning about like the human parts of it. So right. yeah, I'm being right, 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 really right, impatient. Right, right. <laughs> Do you feel like um, that it's hard for you to picture yourself being older? You know, like it's, you're mm-hmm. like, well, if I, like, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I need to do these things now. Or like learn these things now. Yeah. Yeah, I do as well. I still do. And I, I didn't really realize it until I talked to a therapist, one of one of my many therapists over the years, about it. That it's really hard for me to plan to think a couple of years out. So I can imagine if if you feel the same way, like you can't even picture yourself being 30, let alone, you know, 50. Like um, they're like, well, I have to do all these things now. Then next thing you know, you're 30. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, it's good that you are reflecting on that and that you have, you know, uh, that you, you're you aware, aware of it. So I guess it's just a matter of, you know, being patient and giving yourself time yeah. for stuff and, yeah.